Let me at least read our first text, and then we'll also do a little review from last week, and then we'll, I want to move forward. Romans eight twenty eight. Here we go. And we know that all things work together for good to those that love God, to those who are called according to purpose. For whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he predestined, these he also called. Whom he called, these he also justified. And whom he justified, these he also glorified. Now this morning I want to spend some time defining words. Uh, it may be a, make for a good Sunday school class, but the reason why I want to define them, because if a word does not have meaning to you, then it would not be meaningful to you. And sometimes just the very understanding the very defini definition of a word helps us then understand the idea and the concept behind it. And this text here has several words that often are maybe spoken of within the church, but maybe often are not um, defined or given a de definition. And so this morning I would like to give some definitions. But before we move on into that, I want to go back when we said in all things work together for the good. I want to clarify just a couple of things from last week and then add to it. When I mentioned that all things work together for the good, what I was saying is from the whole of your life, from the time that you were conceived until today, all things now are working on your behalf. That's what Paul is saying. But that is not to say that all things that have happened in your life are good. Okay? Some of us have had a lot of horrendous things happen. Not myself. I, just, I used us as uh, generic. But for some people have had a lot of horrendous things happen in their life. Uh, I'm not one of those people. But some hurtful things. And some have been because you've been the recipient of maybe someone else's problems or that you have just made choices, bad choices. And so I would never say that all things in your life are good. That is not the case. But what we're saying is that no matter what that was in your life, no matter how bad it was, uh, you have a choice. I mean, honestly, I want you to hear this, okay? Because I know the, the several in the room this morning fit into this, this grouping here because you've had things that have been very um, difficult to walk through in your life. Those things that you have experienced are still very much a part of your life and you will probably never forget those things in fact even though we cannot relive history it is said that history lives within us and so every experience that we have is somehow lodged within the framework of my body sometimes it's in a chemical format or it's still biological it is there it's not some ethereal thing out in the cloud okay it is something that is within me and those experiences that you've gone through can either keep you bound up in your life because they still can have influences on you. Uh, you know, we, we have all kinds of diagnoses now of, to help people understand why they're still being influenced from the things of the past. But see, this scripture now gives you some hope here. It is what it's saying to you is that even though maybe some very difficult things have happened to you, maybe when you were younger, when God redeems it, when he redeems it, with that redemption comes freedom from it, okay? In other words, I can continue on in my life and allow my past to rule over me and to control me and keep me enslaved, or I can allow God to redeem my past and now that thing that was to my harm is now becoming something to, that helps me, or, or as I said last week, things that were maybe destructive are now constructive. Are you hearing what I'm saying? I mean, some people, maybe, it's, it's amazing how people sometimes don't want to move into freedom. Maybe they feel hopeless, or maybe they feel like they just can't shake the influences. But all the paranoias that we have, the, the depressions, the anxieties that we, so many people struggle with, those can either control you for the rest of your life, and they will not work for you. They will always work against you. Or you can turn your life over to Christ, become in a relationship with him, let him redeem it, and begin to experience freedom in it. But you know, this is an amazing thing. You, you think, you would think, that people want to be free. I can tell you something. In my short history of life, 
I can tell you something. Most people do not want to be free. They really don't. They prefer sometimes the security of their enslavement. You say, well, how? I, I just don't get that. You know why I know that? Is because very few people actually take and make the sacrifices towards freedom. Very few people do. You know when the, the man in the, in the pool of Bethesda in John 5, it's the greatest question I think Jesus ever asked a human being. He asked the man that was there paralyzed for 38 years, he asked this question, do you wish to be made whole? Okay. Now you would think anyone that was paralyzed for 38 years, probably lived in abject poverty forever, would say, oh, absolutely. You'd think that's just a given. That's not a given. The question is a legitimate question. Do you want freedom? Do you want to experience the freedom that redemption brings you? That's a very good question, isn't it? Do you want that? So all things are not good, but all things work together for the good for those that love God. And I gave a, certain, a couple of illustrations in the scripture. Uh, Evelyn, yesterday in the, um, the, Christmas, the, the Christmas in July gathering of the women, she taught on the book of Ruth. Okay? That's an excellent story for Romans 8, 28. I mean, it is. I mean, we have uh, uh, Ruth and Naomi went through some very difficult times, some very, you know, times of famine and loss of family and grief. And, but because we have the whole story, we see that even though in the, in, the, in the natural, it looked like things were going really bad for her and Naomi, but in the end, guess what? It all worked for good, right? So your griefs, your pains, the, th the difficult journeys that you and I have gone through can work for the good for those who are actively loving God. Amen? All things, not just the good things, all things. Okay, now let's, then we, I wanted to go on and say... Um, According to his purpose, and last week I, I defined the word purpose for you about you being a provision that uh, your grand purpose in life is to be a provision for others. I'm not going to continue to make that case, uh, but basically from Genesis all the way through Revelation, what we see is God being a provision for his people. Jesus was a provision for people. They were blind. He helped them see. They were deaf. He helped them hear. They were hungry. He fed them bread. Basically, you become an instrument of God's grace towards others. Now, the best definition of grace, just so you'll know this, I didn't give it last week, is provision. In other words, wherever I see the word grace in the Bible, I could just as well take that out and put the word provision in its place, and that's, it would be true every time. Where Jesus said, my grace is sufficient for you, what he's saying is my provision, right? It's, it, whether it's freedom of sin, whether it's physical healing, whatever it is, God's grace is sufficient, amen? So that's what being a provision is. You become a provision. Okay, so then let's move on now out of that, and let's go into verse 29, and here is where I want to define some terms for you and uh, maybe introduce you to, to some ideas here as we continue on in this idea now. That he's not changing his, the subject here. This is an ongoing maybe description of, of, of what Paul is trying to express here. So for whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. I want to look at at least the first two words here. Foreknew and predestined, okay? Because this is going somewhere, right? Those he foreknew, he predestined. Those he predestined, he called. Those he called, he justified. And those he justified, he glorified. We're not going to look at every term equally. You, this is rule number one whenever you're teaching. Don't ever say you have five points and spend 20 minutes on the first point. That scares everybody because they're thinking, oh my gosh, I got four left. And all you're thinking about from that point on, oh God, we got three left. We got, you know, don't worry, we're going to go really quick through a couple of them, okay? But I want to talk about this foreknowing, okay? And coupling it with predestined. And I want this to encourage you some, okay? Foreknowing in the Bible is not just God knowing the future, okay? That he has knowledge of the future. It includes that, okay? But that's not basically the essence of this term here, is God's ability to know things in the future. In the Hebrew... Knowledge or knowing is a term of intimacy, okay? A term of intimacy. Like for an example, where it said, Adam knew Eve and she conceived, 
Okay? I think we all know what's implied there in this type of knowing. It's an intimate situation. In Proverbs 3 where it says, In all your ways acknowledge him, to ignore him, basically, the, the root there, is to basically say be intimate with God, be connected, be in relationship with him, and he will direct your paths, okay? It's not just giving God a acknowledgement. Okay, God, I know you exist and let's move on. No, to acknowledge him is to know him, is to be in a relationship with him. So here is my point. For whom God foreknew, we could just as well translate it this way, and it would be accurate. Whom he foreloved. Okay, now this is going to be, you're going to, it, it'll build just for a second. Just hold with me. Whom he foreloved, he predestined. Okay, so here's my point. Let's put it this way. Whatever your life has been up to this point, as it, it's at least come out of God's love for you. Okay, this was not a conspiracy of the devil. It was not somehow a conspiracy of the world against you. But whatever God has allowed you to go through, we can at least know this, according to Paul, that it was at least somehow connected that God did not allow to do anything to you because of his great love for you. Now, some people would say, wow, if that's the kind of God there is that's going to let me go through that, that's, the, that's the, exactly the God I don't want. I mean, what kind of loving God would allow me to go through that? And I think that's a very, actually, a, a legitimate question, okay, considering some of the horrendous things that people have gone through. But see, that kind of question, which we were not going to answer today, will only keep you somehow in your own bondage. I'm going to tell you something, because you can either be, continue to be a person of pity that we're going to have pity on, or you can become a person of potential, and that's what we're talking about here. Whom he glorified, and that's what we're going to look at. So you can continue to wallow in your pity, or you can kind of move through this and recognize that even though things have happened in my life, at least I know one thing for sure, God loves me, okay? Now here's the thing about that, is the, um, the four loving of God... Uh, let me, let, me, let me approach it from a different perspective just for a second. We believe this in evangelicalism, that God knows everything, right? We believe that if there's anything that can be name, known, God knows it. That's what we call typically the omniscience of God. God knows everything. Are you with me so far? Okay. So therefore, if it can be known, God knows knows it right but here's another corresponding thought to that the limitation in that knowledge is this that God cannot have a new thought because a new thought would suggest that there is something there that he is what didn't know so the only limitation to his knowledge is he cannot have a new thought because everything that can be known can be known right so you go, well, what does that have to do with what we're talking about that means that there was never a time in God's existence, which we believe is forever and eternal, that he did not love you. There was never a time in his existence that you did not exist because you can't know those things which do not exist. Therefore, what I'm saying is, God never technically chose you as far as like having to deliberate over information and, and making choices. That's just a way for you and I to understand it. Basically, for as long as there's been God, his love for you has existed for you. Are you hearing me? It is an eternal forelove of God that he has for his people. There was never a time that you were not in God's heart in all of his existence because everything that could be known and you were one of those things, he's always known. Isn't that something? You're not a mistake, whether you thought you were a mistake. Your existence here is not a mistake. It doesn't matter if your parents were planning on you getting, getting pregnant or not. That has nothing to do with it. God, you have been in the heart of God for all eternity. And there was never a time in God's life, in God's existence, that he did not love you. It was just that in the fullness of time, at a certain point in 1964, April 23rd, that I came into existence in the world, but God had already loved me before that time. In fact, that's what the scripture said. I think he's what it said, Jeremiah. Before you were even in the mother's womb, I knew you. Right? 
So, what, so what's so good about this is this. The very next word is predestined. I wrote a definition out for this so you could, because sometimes it's better. To be predestined. Now, I want to make one qualification, and maybe this was never an issue with you, but being predestined, and I've made this point before, so if, if it's by review, just take it for what it is. So whom God foreloved forever, he also predestined. That is not the same as predestination as some parts of uh, Christian doctrine about predestination or free will. That is not that. Okay? It's not a predestination. It's a predestined. So here's the actual definition, though. To decree from eternity. That's the Greek word's meaning. To decree from eternity. Another one, to appoint, appoint, to make an appointment, and, which I think is excellent here, to establish boundaries or limits. Now, hear what I'm saying. This is about your life, okay? And destined means the events that have taken place in my life. So like we, we were using Naomi as an example, we would literally say that God had loved Ruth and Naomi from all eternity. There was never a time, but the difficult situations that they experienced were already decreed from eternity. That the lines of their life, the boundaries of their life, had already been appointed. Now, some people might get, well, then, you know, if it's all about God already planned it, how do I have any freedom? Those are different subjects altogether, okay? Just stay with me on this one. You have plenty of freedom, but the fact of the matter is that the lines of your life have already... So, so what are you saying? What are you, what's the point? No matter what you've gone through, no matter the experiences that you have had to endure, know this, that these have been decreed from all eternity not out of a vengeful God not out of an angry God not of a God who can't seem to get control of mankind but because of an everlasting love that he has for you now you would say but why would he allow that if he loves me because that's answered in about three words from now it's the purpose behind it that allowed you to go through certain things and are allowing you to go through certain things because he loves you so greatly because he's trying to make you into something. Are you with me so far? Okay. So whom God, so what are we saying? We know this, that all things are working together for the good. How do I know all things are working together for good? Because God has eternally loved me and has already predestined my life. He has already made sure that the necessary ingredients that it takes to make me become the me that he wants me to be are there in place. See, so you, see you want to say this, golly, but I, just, I question God's love when I'm going through things. In fact, people do usually, right? They usually say, man, why, is, why am I going through this? Does God even love me? Is he mad at me? But see, Paul goes on later on in a few verses and says what? Know this, neither death nor life nor angels nor principalities can ever separate you from the love of God. It's like he goes back and reemphasizes, look, death or star, actually, what did he say? I'm going to tell you something. Here's what's interesting. Let Know this, neither tribulation, distress, persecution, Famine, nakedness, peril, or sword can separate you from the love of God. Now, why would he say that? Because it's exactly when you're in those moments that you're actually questioning God's love for you, aren't you? I mean, that's where you're wondering, my gosh, did I sin? Did I do something wrong? I mean, is this some kind of payday someday with God? No, because none of those things are separating you from the love of God. They are already an expression of God's love for you. Let me ask you something. Was the cross, the brutality of the cross, the, 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 the pain that Christ had to endure, was that from vengeance or was that from love? It's from love. That's what we agree. God willing to demonstrate his love sent his son to die for you, right? So even though in the natural it looks terrible, but the prophet said this, that God is able to take, make beauty from ashes, right? Because of God's love. And his, now, here's an interesting verse in Psalm 16.6. 6. 
David said this, my lines, L-I-N-E-S, fell into pleasant places. So David is saying this, Lord, when you ordered my life, the lines, the, the boundaries have fallen into pleasant places. That's what predestined means. It is God establishing the lines and the boundaries. The good news is your lines have fallen into pleasant places. They have. No matter what you're facing, no matter what it looks like today, I can at least take this to the bank. Your lines are in pleasant places. Now, you may resist it. You may kick against the goes like Paul did. But eventually, you can come to accept it. Let me tell you something. I mentioned this last week, and this is, I, this is something I, I, I want you to get a hold of. Most of our problems that you and I struggle with, the anxieties, the frustrations, the fears, the psychological things that we, most of us go through, are really out of a misinterpretation of the events in our life. See, if you want to make it a devil thing, that the devil is always after you, then I would almost say this, you're so vain, you always think the devil's after you, okay? You know, the song is about you. If you think that the world is conspiring against you and somehow when you leave this building today, the devil is there and he's at your house and he's messing with your... I mean, I'm telling you something. That is a wrong interpretation of life. I'm just going to tell you it is. I, I, in fact, just keep it quiet. He may not even know you exist, okay? I mean, we have created a devil that is almost bigger than God himself. We think he can be all, we think he's all-knowing, all-powerful, omnipresent. We think the devil is everywhere, but he's not, okay? He is a created, one created being that occupies space and time just like you are. He's finite just like you and I are, okay? He cannot be in your house and my house at the very same time. He's not God. Only God can be that way, right? But we create these issues and these scenarios in our mind about what is happening in our world. And that is what creates a lot of the anxieties within us. But see, if you can interpret your life through God's perspective, like Joseph did when he made this powerful statement, like I mentioned last week, what you meant for evil, God meant for good. Basically, Joseph is doing what? He's interpreting the events of his life through the eyes of an everlasting loving God. Basically, that's what he's doing, right? Even though his family betrayed him, even though his bosses betrayed him, even though his country betrayed him, he saw beyond that and saw a God who from all eternity had already predestined him to fulfill his purpose. We don't ever hear Joseph complaining. We don't ever hear Joseph doubting God. We don't ever hear Joseph whining and groaning and talking about all his issues of his mommy and daddy issues. We don't hear that from him because he already knew that God's hand was on his life. Are you with me? Get over your mommy and daddy issues and put your hand in the hands of a loving father, okay? Tell your story once, tell it twice, but forget it after that. Are you with me? Or tired, honestly, people are tired of hearing your story of pain and devastation. It's like hee-haw, gloom, despair, and agony on me. You know what I'm saying? Y'all are too young to remember that song, but there was a song, Ben. It was popular. Everybody could sing it. Y'all remember that, right? Gloom, despair, agony on me. If it weren't for bad luck, I'd have no luck at all. Okay? That was the song sang every single week on hee-haw. Okay? Get past hee-haw and say what you meant for bad, what the devil meant for evil, God has meant for good. Why? Because all things are working for me. Amen? I mean, after a while, i got to tell you, I mean, I know it's probably not in this group here, but someone, my God, has got to say something about it. Okay? You can either be bound your whole life and nobody really cares after about the first two years, or you can let God redeem your life and get over it. Amen? Get over it. I don't care how your mommy treated you, and I really don't care how your daddy treated you, but I do know one thing. There is a loving Heavenly Father who has predestined your life. Amen? Okay, enough of that. Let's get past that. Okay, let's look at this one, the next one. 
whom to be conformed to the image of his son. This is a quick one, okay? I don't want to spend a lot of time on this one, even though it is the most potent of all the statements made here, okay? But one, one brief thing here. To be conformed by the definition is to, I wrote it down just so I could say it. Where did I write it? Here it is. Having the same inner essence, identity, the form. Showing similar behavior from having the same essential nature. Now, what am I saying here? See, when we're talking about conformity, we're not, this is not anything like the conformity in Romans 12, where it says, be not conformed to this world. It's not the same word at all. This word is only used one time in the New Testament at all. Okay? And this is what it means. To be of like nature, which results in like behavior. It's not like a shape where you pour plaster in a form. We're not talking about that. What we're saying is God's purpose for you is to make you essentially like the sun. Okay? How does that happen? Well, we would say it this way. The divine Jesus became flesh so that the flesh, us, can take on the divine. There's the two natures of Christ and there's the two natures of you now. How do you get the second nature? By being born again. Okay? The second nature is awakened in you and birthed in you by being born again. So the Word became flesh, Jesus became flesh, and then we had the two natures of Jesus, all fully God, fully man. But we're not going to be fully God and fully man, but what we have, though, is we could not achieve the divine without Him. But when he, now He is picking us up from below and lifting us to the above, whereas the above came to the below. That's another way of describing it, okay? Are you with me? So what is he saying? The son, S-O-N, is saying something different, though, than him just saying being conformed to Jesus. Okay, he could have said that, but that's not what's being said here. He's not just trying to make you like Jesus. Now, sometimes when we're thinking about making you like Jesus, we, we're looking at Jesus' life in the New Testament. We're saying, okay, he did this, and I need to do that, or what would Jesus do, WWJD? This is not WWJD. It will, it will do that, don't get me wrong, but that's not what it's saying here. He's not saying he wants you to act like Jesus. He's saying you're going to be like him. Okay. There's going to be an essential nature embedded in you, namely what we call the Holy Spirit of God, the Spirit of the Son. Okay. Now, Son, S-O-N, is one of the key words within Romans 8. Perhaps you've never noticed that. But over and over it's mentioned, those who are led of the Spirit, these are sons of God. And later on it says that the whole creation is waiting for the manifestations of the sons of God. It also says that you have not received the spirit of slavery, but a spirit of adoption as sons, okay? So the S-O-N is different than just saying everybody's going to be like Jesus. Sonship in the Bible is about position and maturity. It's about coming into your inheritance, when a person is young, he's like a slave. That's what Galatians says. But as he matures and grows up, he begins to enter into the inheritance that the Father has for him. In other words, he begins to take his place in the family. Are you with me? What is he saying here? It's not just about WWJD. This is about you becoming like the son who also entered into his inheritance, you too will be receding and reigning with him in heavenly places. His journey is your journey. Are you with me? So what am I saying? How I was born, the way I was raised, the parents I had, the neighborhood I lived in, the work that I've had, the marriages that I've had, whatever. Whatever you have experienced in your life, has all come from the hands of a loving God because he is predestined your life to become like the Son. The same journey, different cross, different betrayals, different, different situations, but at the end, it's all glory. Are you with me? It's all glory. Sonship. That's not to be confused with being a child. 
You're born into the family. You're not a stepchild. You're not an adopted child. You're born into the family of God through rebirth. But being a child is not the same as being a son. You enter into sonship. Now, what does it say? He's the firstborn. Look at that, what it says there. That he might be conformed to the image of the son, that he might be the firstborn. What does it mean to be the firstborn? Well, I wrote the definition down for you. It means to be the prototype, a first from which all other forms are developed. What am I saying? Jesus was the prototype of the new creation of God. You with me? That's becoming like him. Jesus is the prototype. Do you want to know what your journey is? Where this is all leading in the age and the age and the age and maybe the ages to come? See, I am not of the belief that salvation or redemption ends in the next 15 years for me. I am of the belief that this coming to be like Christ will take perhaps age after age after age. I am not of the belief that just because you die tomorrow, you automatically become like Jesus, okay? I think that's faulty. But I am on the journey, okay? And throughout whatever the history or the, the future of mankind is, I believe that you are going to be like him as well. Amen? Okay. In degrees as we move forward. Now, notice this where he says, Moreover, whom he predestined, we looked at that, these he also called, I'll make one minute on this one. This is not him picking up the telephone for you, okay? Hello, will you decide to join in on this deal? That's not that. This is what they call an effectual call. This means when Jesus calls, you answer. Now, what does it mean to be called? Well, let's go back to the guy that I used at the very beginning. I just came up with it. John 5, the guy that was paralyzed. When Jesus told the man to rise up, take up his pallet, and walk, that man had nothing in him, in and of himself, to be able to do that. He was paralyzed. Jesus didn't say, let me give you a hand, and I'll help you stand up and walk. All he said was, take up your pallet and walk. So obviously... When Jesus says things, embodied in those words are what? The grace and the power to perform those things, right? When he said, take up your pallet and walk, that effectual command, that effectual call, carried with it enough grace to allow that man's legs and leg or his limbs to be restored. Are you with me? He didn't just say, now give it a shot here, God. Or, you know, believe and try to get that thing moving. No. My point is this, when Jesus calls you, with the call becomes the power to enable you to respond to the call. In other words, whatever he's called you to do, he's given you the power to do it because that's part of the calling, right? Are you with me? So whom he foreloved, he already established the boundaries of your life, and he has empowered you to become conformed, not in the external sense, but he has empowered you now to be like Jesus in the essential sense because it's Christ in you, the very nature of Christ. Are you with me? Okay. But to do that, he had to do what? He had to justify. He had to get rid of your sin issues. Okay. But then let's end with the last word. Then those he justified, whom he justified, these he also glorified. That's the end journey, okay? I was raised in church my whole life, okay? And we would, glory, G-L-O-R-Y, was one of the most common terms said in the church. Glory to God, something like that. Sometimes we just shouted glory. Glory, okay? I mean, glory was all over the place. And the closest we ever got to it was there... This is, I haven't even heard this teaching in a long time. It's probably out there. I just don't listen to a lot of teachers much. But the thing is, it, it was called the Shekinah glory. And that was the glory that was supposed to be in the tabernacle of the wilderness. And, you know, the glory of God was there on the Ark of the Covenant. And there was a lot about glory, okay? But honestly, in the first 40 years of my life, I never heard a definition of glory. I didn't know what it meant to be glorified. I didn't know what it meant to do things to the glory of God. I didn't know anything like that. All we did was we used the word, but never put a definition. We always considered it almost a mysterious term.
term to be glorified. It almost is though we were going to become almost like angelic spiritual beings after we resurrect from the dead, and we're going to kind of have a glow about us, and that was kind of seen as the glory, okay? But that may be some of that, but that's not this, okay? To be glorified is to be exactly what God has made you to be, okay? That's what it is. That's why you, we are, you and I have unique personalities. I believe that you're going to carry that personality from here through all eternity, okay? We're not all going to become what we call, everybody's going to think, act, be like Jesus. No, we're going to all look like a bunch of little Jesuses. No, we have unique personalities. God has made us that way. But we will all become what he called us to be. We've already looked at a little bit what that is. So here's my point. The glory of a lion is when he's not acting like an elephant, right? Right? The glory of a lion is when he is being fully a lion. That's what we would say, the glory of the lion. What we say, the glory of an athlete. When, we, when someone runs a race or does something spectacular in the athletic field, what we would say is what? Man, that was the glory of the athlete. Man, that was glorious. We'd say something like that. It's glorious, right? What we're saying is when man or God or animal is being exactly what they are created to be, that is the glory of man. And when you are exactly who you're created to be, that is the glory of you. You can never be anything other than you. Did you know that? In fact, when you try to be like other people, you don't do very well, right? When you try to mimic other people, you try to act like other people, that's part of growing up in confusion of who you are and your identity because you don't know what group you're supposed to be. You're supposed to be the cowboy group, the dope group, the, the hip group. I mean, what, we're always trying to find ourselves and our identity. We're trying to pattern ourselves after something else. But that's when you're not you. When you are you and the you that God has made you to be, that's when you are most successful. Did you know that? That's when you're most successful. When you're trying to be like somebody else is when you're not successful. So God is working your life because there's only one of you, one thumbprint, one soul, one identity, one personality. There's no one ever like you. Here's my point. If you, if you are you, you'll be the most unique person you'll ever be because there's only one of you. You see, we try to be unique. We want to be unique. You want to be special. But we try to do it externally with the way we dress or padding up. I mean, I'm saying we're always trying to be unique externally. Be unique internally. That is the deposit that Christ has made. Are you with me? And God is working in your life to make you the person that you, he's always loved you to be from all eternity. He wants you, not somebody else. Are you with me in that? So here's what, here it is, closing statement. This is it. In light of all of that, we know what? That all things now are working together for my good. Because he called me. That's an effectual call according to a purpose. And when he called me, he... He called me out of a for loving me, and he for loved me, and he then predestined it to be like Jesus or to be like the Son. But to, for me to be like the Son then is to reach the highest potential that I can ever be because that is my true glory, Christ in me, being all that I can be. Amen? I can tell you something, church. We struggle our whole lives trying to be things. Accept the lines, the journey, the life that God has given you. Quit complaining about it and start thanking him for it. Okay? Quit complaining about it. If you're bound up, then get free from it. Quit trying to always go back and figure out why you're so screwed up. Just accept the fact that God has redeemed your life from the pit. Okay? He's redeemed it from the pit. And accept that. Sometimes it's nice to know why you're screwed up, but I'm going to tell you something. All that does sometimes is give us another excuse of being screwed up. 
You know what I'm saying? You know, when, when, when girls are promiscuous or something, we want to say, well, you know, when they were young, they may, their, their dad did this or some uncle. They were, they were this, and now they're this. Now they're messed up as adults. You know what? You don't know that for a fact. I can tell you something. There's been a lot of girls that are screwed up that had, no, had great dad and uncle and brother relationship. You know what I'm saying? See, we want to connect it to something to somehow give us some kind of security in that we should be screwed up. Does that make sense? But I've seen it. I'm not saying people don't get screwed up. I'm just saying when you are trying to attach it to something else, sometimes you're chasing a black cat in a dark room. We know there's a cat somewhere, but just accept the light and the door opening of the room and walk out and experience freedom. Amen? See, psychiatry, that's all psychiatry can do is help you try to figure out your issues. That's all they can do. I'm telling you, that's all they can do. Trust me, that is it. That's not Jesus. He's not here to help you figure out your issues. He is literally trying to del deliver you from your issues. Amen? That's why the, this is not a, a, a psychology book. It's not the DVM, what do they call it? You know, mental health development issue book. It's not that. It's God's liberation book. Amen? God, we just thank you.